This is lesson 123, and I did something kind of interesting with this lesson, and I'm going to talk about it in just a minute, but uh, I do want to make sure, Darren, that we can pass out those, uh, that little, I did a little something different with this lesson tonight, so I'm going to invite you to, good, Bobby's going to get it. Did you get one, honey, already? Get one for everybody. Let's get one for everybody. I don't, <laughs> think, it, I don't think everybody picked one up. I want you to have that one, uh, the, the two sides that I picked up, because as I looked at this lesson, it reminded me of um, the Beatitudes. Remember the Beatitudes in the Bible? You know much about them? It's interesting, I was looking up what basically the idea of the Beatitudes were, and it says, the Beatitudes of Jesus provide a way of life that promises salvation. They also provide peace in the midst of our trials and tribulations on this earth. So what it's saying is these Beatitudes that Jesus spoke when he was on, when he gave his Sermon on the Mount, is that correct, Mr. Paul? I'm looking yeah. at you. Okay, just want to make sure. Uh, I don't know why I call him Mr. Paul. It's like, <laughs> this is weird. I'm married to him. So anyway, but we do this with kid singers, and it's, it's respect. That's what it is. But in Matthew, the Beatitudes are mentioned. I'm sure they're mentioned in other uh, books of the Bible. But Jesus gave eight Beatitudes, and these were eight blessings, basically. Eight, eight, eight ways that make you happy. And that's really what these are about, this, these be grateful, be thankful. That's all through here. And so I picked these out in a way that we can see them. And as, we, as our viewers watch tonight, they're going to see this up on the screen. Uh, our listeners, if you by any chance are a listener and didn't get a chance to view it, you can always go and view it. Uh, as a subscriber, you can view it. But if you ever need a copy, we could easily send you a copy of this too. But in, if you remember the Beatitudes from the Bible, they're, they're basically um, uh, blessed are the merciful, blessed are the pure of heart, blessed are the peacemakers, uh, you know, blessed are the poor in spirit, uh, blessed, are, uh, blessed are they who mourn. They're, they're, there's blessings. They're basically blessings of, of actions we can do in our lives. And they go into a little more detail. And again, this was a way that Jesus was helping the people of the time learn how to have a more... Uh, abundant life, a more peace-filled life. And that's what these attitudes, these could be our beatitudes. Jesus had eight, this time he's got 12. He's added a few extra. And then he's got kind of three instructions at the end that we'll, we'll talk about in just a little bit. But before we get to that, I thought it was, again, uh, important to talk about our, our spiritual growth. Because I do get a lot of questions from people that say, you know, I don't understand the course. I don't understand this idea that the world is an illusion. And one of our listeners, Karen, uh, who listens in, in Central California, and she posted this on the, on the listener board, and people try to help her to respond to it. Oh, she's watching. Oh, good, Karen. We're glad you're watching. Is, uh, say hi to Karen. Hi, Karen. There she is. Okay. So uh, she was saying, <laughs> I love it. Darren gives me this thing like two little eyes. And I'm thinking, what, you got glasses on? I couldn't understand what he was saying. Anyway, I, yeah, you see how I don't get things. You can't give me. You got to say what's going on. You can't go <laughs> you know, like that. I don't know. Uh, but she was mentioning how she's confused about illusions. And of course, in Miracles, it seems to say that our world is an illusion. Is that correct? It, it says the world is not your reality. Yes. It says this world, and, and from that standpoint, then we don't see anything clearly. But let's keep going. I've also heard it said that nothing in the world really happened. So I struggle, and that's a hard one. I struggle to make sense of this. If the world is an illusion and nothing really happened, I don't know how to disengage this worldly stuff. I also subscribe to Marianne Williamson's talks, and I listen to her speak about per participating in politics. So that confuses me more. Can any of you clarify this for me? And so this was on the, on the listener board. And I wanted to bring this to mind because she said in here, which I think is an important thing, uh, where she says, can any, well, what my, my first question was, uh, if the world is an illusion, then nothing really, I don't know how to disengage with this worldly stuff. Good. I would say, good for you. <coughs> that you say you do not know, <coughs> yay. Because the problem is, is we think we know how to handle this stuff. And we get caught into a spider web of, of craziness and we don't know how to get out of it. And that is exactly right. Now, the fact that the world is an illusion shouldn't surprise anybody at all. You know, what I told you before, I, I often say that there was a meme that was out there about the, the white dress and the blue dress. Remember the big thing online 
where it says, what do you see? Do you see the white dress with, uh, what, uh, a blue lace or the, or the blue dress with gold lace? You know, that thing was a big meme that was out there. I mean, I looked it up. It was like millions of people were talking about this thing. And what they said was it, was, it was, it wasn't meant to be an illusion, but what happened was our past thinking projected onto this, uh, the, the lighting you watched or looked at it in made you see one color over another. It became kind of a whole thing about science and the way we view. But it wasn't trying to be that. It was just some woman posting her wedding, this dress that she was going to wear to a wedding and asking her friend what she thought of it. But it became this big social commentary on perception. So this idea that the world is an illusion or that we do not see things the way they are should not be surprising at all. Now, Jesus basically was saying that 2,000 years ago, over 2,000 years ago. This world is not your home. You know, he was talking about something beyond this, something more than this. When, when questioned by the people of the time saying, and I love this, this was always a great one of Jesus where he was questioned because in those days, if, if a man was married to a woman and the husband died, the woman would kind of become the property of the husband's brother and he would, she would marry him. So the question was, this happened, and they said, okay, now when they die, who's she gonna mar be married to in heaven? Is she gonna be married to her original husband or is she gonna be married to the brother now? This could be very confusing up in heaven. And Jesus, who looked at them with this question, this is what you wanna know? This of all, the, he didn't say that, but I could just be thinking, this of all the questions on earth, this is what you wanna figure out. Why is that? Because this is where we live. We live in who's gonna be married to who, who's gonna get what, all these things, and Jesus chuckled and he said, there are no bodies in heaven. Now, that's about all he said. There wasn't much more that went on after that. We're like the angels, he said, you know. Now that's about all he had to say, like I said, because we have to, I think that Jesus was wise enough to know that he spoke at what was, what someone was able to understand at that point in time. So the course is always telling us this world is not your home, this is not your reality, that, uh, a, and how the, the impossible occurred, it says, it says we don't wanna spend a whole lot of time on it because if you are thinking that and spending a, load, a lot of time focusing on it, then we give more power to the problem that was never real in the first place. But to give it some sort of perspective, it says that a mad idea entered the mind of the Son of God that he could be separate from his source. And this idea, the Son of God looked at and remembered not to laugh. And in his not laughing, did the idea become real and seem to have real consequences. And that's kind of where we find ourselves. What has happened is it's projected over and over and over and over again. So it seems to be real. Time seems to play a role. But what we learn over time is that even scientists are saying time as we know it is not as it is. We have a lot of physicists out there that say a lot of things that I can't understand. I mean, m most of us can't understand unless you're Stephen Hawking, is it? You know, most of us don't get it. But there, there are string theories out there. There's all sorts of theories telling us that everything is occurring right now. Well, how does that happen? We don't know, and yet that doesn't stop science from postulating those things. We believe that the beginning of matter happened in what? A Big Bang, can that be any more unscientific? I don't know about you, but the, just the idea that some bang happened, and their, their reason for saying it is they don't know. So they just say at once, every type of physical mass ever made was made in that moment. Nothing can ever be made other than that. Everything happened in that moment. Well, why is that as easy to accept as the idea that a mad idea entered the mind of the Son of God, that he forgot his reality. Why is that just not as possible as a bang somewhere? 